of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as we near the start of the happy holiday season, the Blue Coal Dealers of America wish you, the members of their vast unseen audience, the merriest Christmas ever. And they present as their special Christmas gift to you a heartwarming Yuletide adventure of the shadow. Before the shadow starts his adventure, I'd like to add my Christmas greetings to those of the Blue Coal Dealers of America. You know, their product, Blue Coal, is the modern equivalent of the old-fashioned Yule Log. You can depend upon Blue Coal to bring warmth, good cheer, and comfort to your home 24 hours of the day. And with each order of Blue Coal is included the free extra home heating service of your friendly Blue Coal dealer. Is your bin well filled for the holidays? If not, phone your neighborhood Blue Coal dealer first thing in the morning. The Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the Shadow, Cranston is gifted with a hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible Shadow belongs. Today's drama, Joy's Christmas Story. Was there any particular destination you was wanting me to drive you to, Mr. Cranston, hey? I'm looking for little Joey, the newsboy. Oh, well, if it's a paper you want, I could stop at any... No, no, we're looking for Joey, Shrevy. We have a special date with him that we keep every Christmas season. Oh, you mean like a horrendous bull, huh? <laughs> That's yeah. right, Shrevy. Every year for the past three seasons, we've taken Joey on a tour of the toy sections of all the department stores. Oh, well, now, ain't that nice. You know... This time of year, I get wishing I was a kid again myself. Ain't that silly? No, of course not, Shrevey. We all feel that way. You know, my friend and acquaintance, Big Charlie, of whom you have heard me speak? Yes. Well, him and me used to have some fun at Christmas time when we was kids. That is, uh, till Big Charlie spoiled it. Well, how was that? Well, he got a bandit from all the toy departments in the stores. But why? Oh, just on account of one pinchy little thing he used to do. Well, what was it? Giving Santa Claus a hot foot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fine thing to do. <laughs> oh, look, Lamont. There's little Joy on the corner. Stop your cab, Shrevey, will you? Hey, Mr. Cranston. Gosh, I thought maybe you wasn't coming. Well, how are you, Joey? I'm fine, thanks. Hello, Miss Lane. Hello, Joey. Are you all set for our little excursion, Joey? Well, I still have a couple of papers left. Oh, well, how many papers have you? Let's see. Two, four, six, six, ten, eleven. Eleven I got. Eleven, eh? Well, do you think five dollars would pay for them? Gosh, five bucks. Gee, Mr. Cranston, I... Ah, you shouldn't give me that much <laughs> Now, throw your papers away and we'll hop into the cab. Well, uh, would you, would you mind if I don't throw them away? Well, I mean, it's being almost Christmas and everything. Well, I like to give them away to some certain people who couldn't maybe afford to buy one. Why, sure. Go ahead, Joey. Gosh, thanks again, Mr. Cranston. Hey, Willie, here's a paper. Compliment to Joey. Oh, he's Mr. a swell kid. <laughs> Look at him. You'd think he was giving away a million dollars. That's just about what it is to him, too. Yeah, that, that, that kid is a regular character. I hope he saves a paper for me, hey. Oh, Shrevey, I don't think you're on his charity list. <laughs> That's what I get for owning a cab. Well, <laughs> I got rid of more but one, Mr. Cranston. Well, good. Let's get into the cab. Okay. That's it. Well, why'd you save the one paper, Joey? Oh, that's me old friend, Hobo Sam. He gets a lot of good out of a paper. Really? How's that? Well, when he finishes reading it, he wears it inside his shirt to keep warm. And the evening record's the warmest paper in town. <laughs> <laughs> they should advertise that. As I said before, that kid's a character, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell us where Hobo Sam can be found, and we'll stop off there before we go to the store. He's found a street away. Hey, look, there's my pop. Hey, would you please go slow past this corner, Mr. Shrevey? Oh, sure thing, sure thing. Every little bit helps, thank you. Hiya, Pop! Hello, son. Pop, <laughs> he didn't he look nice, though? I bet you that he's the best-looking street corner Santa Claus in the whole world. Joey, uh, how long has he been doing that job? Oh, ever since the holiday season started. He kind of needed a job, too. 
You see, he ain't been able to get much work the last couple of years. Well, it's, it's good that he's found something at Christmas time anyway, Joey. Yeah, that's what I told him. But the money he's been making on this job is going out for back rent and bills and things. It ain't really Christmas money. Oh, so your prospects for Christmas are still none too bright. Well, Mr. Krantz and I ain't worried. Pop will find some way for us to have a good Christmas. You see, when he's worried like of anything, me and him take a walk down by the docks. We sit on the pier and watch the water going by. You know, Pop says that watching the water like that makes him all easy inside again. See, I like going down there with him. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, Joey. Well, I figured you'd probably... Hey, look! There's Hobo Sam! Hey, will you stop a minute, Mr. Shreezy? Yeah, totally sure, totally sure. Hey, Sam, wait a minute! I got something for you! Excuse me, please, I'll be right back. All right. I got a paper for you, Sam! Lots of ads in it, too! It's practically an overcoat! <laughs> oh, Lamont. I wish there was something that we could do for Joey's family as well as for him. We will, Marco. We will do something. But it can't be charity. They're much too proud to accept that. There must be some way to help, though. We'll find a way. Leave it to me. Okay, I'm, I'm ready, Mr. Clancy. Well, how did Hobo Sam like the paper? Uh-huh. I'd say, was he glad to get the paper? Oh. Hobo Sam. Oh, oh, Hobo Sam, yeah, yeah. Well, what's the matter, Joey? You seem worried. Well, I I just found out something from Hobo Sam. Oh, What? He just told me that the father of one of the kids I run around with was on his way to a house on Water Street to murder a guy. What? A guy murdered? Did he say, hey? Did you get the address? Yeah, yeah, 18 Water Street. Well, we better notify the police at once. They ain't time for that, Mr. Cranston, but you could help. Uh, how? Well, you got a reputation as a gentleman detective-like, and you could do something about this yourself. Well, I... What is a guy being murdered, Mr. Cranston? Very well. Shrevy, 18 Water Street, and hurry. <laughs> You got the right address, Joey. This is just an old deserted warehouse. I know this is the right place, Miss Lane. A lot of the men come here to play cards and stuff. Well, we'll see what's in this room here. Come on. A mom. Look at this room. Yes. Furniture broken and strewn all over the room. Well, there's, there's been a fight here, all right. Yeah, this must be the place. This must be it. Look. Right there. Blood on the floor. Yes, I see it. No sign of a body, though. No sign of a body. No. Joy, what are you doing? Oh, just making notes in my notebook. I like to keep a record of how a detective works. This room looks as if a dozen men had staged a brawl here. Looks like a dozen men. More notes, Joey? Uh, yes, sir. I can't make head or tail of this thing. Dozens of clues and no evidence. Come on, look here. Hey, what is it, Mongo? Note. I found it on the floor. Hey, what does it say? Hurry to 19 West Street before another disaster occurs. Well, that's a mighty convenient message. They must have been expecting help. Come on. We're going to 19 West Street. Oh, there's the number. 19 West Street. And I am attempted to add in a very unusual neighborhood this address is in. Yeah, it's just an old boarded-up tenement house. Well, let's have a look. How can we even get into the place? The doors are all barred. Yes. We may have trouble forcing an entrance. Hey, you think maybe the body's in there, Mr. Cleese? I never make predictions in a case like this, Joey. No predictions. Hey, how do you spell predictions, Mr. Cleese? Oh, please, Joey. Forget your notebook for a moment, will you? Yeah, but it's all in a line of duty, Mr. Cleese. Lamont, look up there by that window. There's a piece of paper tacked to it. Oh, yes. Uh, get it for me, will you, Joey? Yes, sir. Lamont, what is all this about? Margo, I haven't the slightest idea. Here you are, Mr. Cranston. It's a note, all right. All right, let me have it. Please come at once to 66 Broom Street. Urgent. Hey, that's my address. That's where I live. Hurry, will you hurry? right on this floor. Up here's a sort of a storage place like, kind of an attic. Oh, I suppose we better look up there. Oh, Joey, look, what are you doing home so early? Oh, hello, Mom. I'm, uh, working on something. Oh, again, Look, eh? Mom, please, please. Uh, this here is, uh, Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston. Oh, How do you do, Miss How do you do? Can you pop get home yet? Well, you know he has another hour to work in the corner. And what are you up to now, young man? You think there's a dead man up in the attic. A dead man? Oh! <gasps> No, no, don't be alarmed, Mrs. McNulty. It's, uh, 
just a superstition. Well, whatever it is, I don't like it. Oh, don't you really think that there's a dead guy up there, Mr. Cranston? No, I don't think so, Joey. Yeah, but them notes and the blood and everything in the warehouse. What about them? Well, don't that mean somebody's dead? Not necessarily. But it does in all the detective stories. You read detective stories, do you, Joey? Well, sure, sure. I'm surprised at you, Mr. Cranston. I always thought that when the detective saw blood and everything... But I'm not even sure it was blood. It was so blood. How do you know? How do I know? Didn't I cut my own finger? Uh Uh-huh. I suspected as much. Yeah, but wait wait a minute. What I meant to say was... Well, I mean... You mean you staged this whole thing just for our benefit, didn't you? Well, I... uh... Joey, did you do that? Well, maybe I sort of did it that. What did they do? What are you up to now, young man? <laughs> Just a little game that Joey played on us, Mrs. McNulty. A game that sort of backfired. Oh, oh, gee. And I thought I had it planned so good. You did, Joey. You just made one mistake. Only one? What? <laughs> what? Those notes were all in your own handwriting. The same handwriting you used in your notebook. What do you know? Am I a dope? <laughs> oh. What was that? Joey, is this part of your game? No, no, I don't. I don't know nothing about that. Well, we better have a look up here in this attic. Uh, wait there, Margo. Hey, I'm coming with you. That's the door right ahead. Oh. Keith, Keith, Mr. Murphy. Oh, he's been hit on the head. Hey, that's a nasty wound. Who is he, Joey? Well, Mr. Murphy sort of the rich guy here in the neighborhood. And he's the meanest and stingiest one, too. Oh, I see. Uh, what happened? What happened to you, sir? Uh, it's his on the head. Well, who did it? Uh, I don't know. Blow came from behind Hit me. Rob me. Hey, look, here's his yeah. pocketbook on the floor. Well, let me see it, Joey. Here you are. Well, there's still some money in it. Ten dollars. How much money did you have, Mr. Murphy? Seventy-five. Seventy-five dollars. Oh, that's strange. If it was robbery, why did your assailant leave you the ten dollars? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, he's pissed out again. Well, I wonder how the person who attacked him made his getaway... There are no windows in this room, and we were at the only door. Gosh, then it must have been... Oh. Huh? What were you going to say? Nothing. It must have been who, Joey? I didn't say nothing. Uh, very well. You'd rather not tell me. We'd better get Mr. Murphy down to your apartment at once. Well, the wound isn't serious, but... Uh... It might not be wise to move him until a doctor has had a chance to look him over. I'll phone for Dr. Collins right away. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. McNulty. Thanks. Now, uh, Margot, if you could get me some hot water, please. I didn't know you were home. Hey, Pa! I I guess you were so busy cooking, you didn't hear me come in. For no, Pa. I'd have seen you. Hey, Pa, come on in here. Hello, son. What's going on here? Mr. Murphy, he got hit and robbed. Oh, well, well, no, that's too bad. Yeah, uh, these are friends of mine, Pop. Uh, Miss Lane and Mr. Clancy. How do you do, Miss McNulty? How do you do? Mighty glad to know you, folks. Well, I I think we better be getting along, Joey. Yeah, I guess maybe you had. But uh, let's make a date now to go to the stores tomorrow afternoon, Joey. Oh, sure, sure. Thanks. Goodbye, Joey. Miss McNulty. Hello. Bye. What do you suppose happened to that man, Lamont? I'm not quite sure yet. There are several things that are obviously not on the up and up. Wait a minute. What do you mean? Well, first of all, why should the crook, whoever he was, leave ten dollars in the man's purse? Yes, I thought of that. And secondly, how did he make his escape from that loft? And why was little Joey so upset by it? He almost revealed something to me up there, and then he changed his mind. Why do you suppose Mr. McNulty acted so strangely? I'm just as curious about that as you are, Margot. I don't believe his story about coming into the house unnoticed. Tomorrow, Margot, we're going to stop at Mr. McNulty's corner and have a little talk with Santa Claus. Before Lamont Cranston interviews Santa Claus, put yourself in his place just a moment. If you had the privilege of a personal interview with Chris Kringle, what would you ask him to bring you? Well, maybe you ladies would ask him for a handkerchief, and possibly you gentlemen would put in a bid for some neckties. But if Santa Claus should bring you a sack full of blue coal, ah, that would bring real Christmas cheer to ladies and gentlemen alike. For blue coal is America's finest hard coal. It burns better, banks better, 
distributes steady, long-lasting, convenient heat from cellar to attic of your home. And then supposing you've got a blue coal automatic heat regulator, neatly done up in a special holiday wrapping. Then you'd be doubly lucky, for you'd have the perfect heating combination for economy and comfort. Blue coal and a blue coal automatic heat regulator. But if you don't get the opportunity to interview Santa Claus personally, here's the next best thing to do. Phone your friendly blue coal dealer. You'll find him willing and eager to help you with any home heating problem. His name is listed in the Where to Buy It section of your classified telephone directory under the words Blue Coal. And now back to Joey's Christmas Story. Well, there he is, Margo. Uh, what you're putting on this snow now? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. McNulty. Yeah. Oh, I... I beg your pardon. I I thought that this was Mr. McNulty's corner. Well, it was till this morning. Well, what happened? Oh, he didn't show up, so I got his uniform and location. Well, uh... uh where, where is he, do you know? Well, you got me, mister. Maybe he's up at the North Pole getting the reindeer ready for the big run. <laughs> Get the pot we should stuff him for over the mantelpiece. Well, Lamont, what do you suppose has happened to him? I don't know. Something is wrong, though. I think that the shadow has a call to make at the McNulty flat. Now, let me see. Is, is that two cups of flour or one cup of flour? Oh, dear. Who is that? Now, don't be alarmed, Mrs. McNulty. I've come here to talk to you. But where are you? Who are you? I'm called the Shadow. Don't try to find me. I'm standing right here beside you. But by my power, I've hypnotized your mind so that you cannot see me. I, I don't understand. What do you want of me? I've come here to help you. How? How? Where's your husband? I... I don't know. Please have confidence in me. He's in trouble, isn't he? Yes. Tim is in trouble. Is it about money? Yes. Oh, yes, you do know, don't you? Not the whole story. No, oh, Tim's a good man, a good man, believe me. And what he done, he done because, well, because of me and little Joey. Tell me about it, please. Well, last night, after the doctor come and took Miss Murphy home, Tim made me a present of $65. Did you... Did you know where the money came from? No. I mean, I I wasn't sure. I asked him about it. I asked him where he come upon such a sum of wealth, and he avoided the question. I see. All he could tell me was that this Christmas, Joey and I were going to have all the things he couldn't give us in the past. I understand, Mrs. McNulty. And this morning, after he went to work, I, I found this note from Tim, sitting on the kitchen table. What does the note say? It says that he was the one that robbed Mr. Murphy. Oh, my Tim done that. My poor Tim. Did he explain why he did that? Oh, yes. That the money had been owed to him by Mr. Murphy for several years. He tried many times to collect it from him, but Mr. Murphy is, well, a kind of a stingy person, you see. So he chose that way of getting the money that was rightfully his. Yes, that was it. Oh, but he knew he'd done wrong in doing it that way. Tim knows that now. He knows that he'd acted in desperation just for me and little Joey. That was the only reason. I believe that. It couldn't have been anything else. No, he's ashamed. He's ashamed most of all because little Joey knows he'd done it. You see, there's, there's a back stairway from our flat to the attic, and Joey knows that. And he knew that his pop had used those stairs. Where do you think your husband's gone? Oh, if I only knew. Oh, but that isn't my only worry. Well, what do you mean? I'm afraid little Joey's gone, too. Why? He said he'd be home by two o'clock, and it's almost six now, and no sign of him. And about an hour ago, one of his little friends come by to find out where he was. He told me that Joey hadn't been on his corner all day. Now, Mrs. McNulty, don't worry. Please. <laughs> I give you my word. They'll return. And everything... 
everything will turn out all right. Well, what did you find out, Lamont? Joey's father was the one who robbed the man, all right. Oh, Lamont. No, both he and little Joey have disappeared. Oh, how awful. Oh, it's not that bad, Marco. I think I can find them on the docks at Water Street. Why'd you have to do that to Mr. Murphy? I... I don't know, son. Golly, we didn't need the money that bit. Ah, uh, Joey, can't you understand? This year I wanted you and your mother to have all the things I couldn't give you in the past. I've been a failure, Joey. A failure. Ah, oh, that ain't no way to talk. You've been a swell, Pop. Whatever you've done, you've done better than anybody in the whole world. Even Santa Claus. And you're the best Santa i ever seen. Better even than the real one. Ah, uh, that's nice to hear, Joey, but can't so. Pop, I don't know what got into you. Don't you remember all the things you told me when we'd been down here by the river before? About courage and hope and the future and all the things you told me I should look for. That was for you, Joey, not for me. Yeah, but I'm part of you, Pop. Whatever you are, that's what I am. And Mom feels the same way. We're all together. All for each other, honest. Joey is right, Mr. McNulty. Who was that? Who spoke? I did. Who are you? Men call me the Shadow. The Shadow? Holy smoke, it's the Shadow, Pop. You heard of him, the invisible guy. Yes, Shadow. If you've heard of me, then you both know that I'm here to help you. Gee, gee, you hear that, Pop? The Shadow's going to help us. Yes, but, but how? I know of the trouble that you're in, Mr. McNulty. I know what you did to Mr. Murphy. Oh, he wasn't to blame for that, honest, Mr. Shadow. Yes, I was. I was, Joey. But Mr. Murphy was a mean old man. He had plenty of dough, and he owed Pop that money for years and years and never paid it to him. That's why Pop done what he's done. I know. I realize that, Joey. Well, what I did was wrong, Joey, and I must pay for it. I'm going to tell my story to the police. Oh, no, no! I don't think that will be necessary, Mr. McNulty. There's another way. A better way. Well... What is it? I want you and young Joey to go to Mr. Murphy's house. Tell him what you've done. Oh, he'd send Pop to jail for life. Wait, now do as I say, please. I'll be there with you. I believe if you explain your reasons to him, honestly and sincerely, tell him why you did what you did to him, even as hard a man as Mr. Murphy will listen to reason on this night of nights, Christmas Eve. <laughs> I had a feeling that you'd done this to me from the very beginning, McNulty. But I've come to ask your forgiveness, Mr. Murphy. Yeah. I've come here to ask you to understand why I did it. You robbed me. That was all. That's why you did it. But it was really Pop's money. Makes no difference. Turning you over to the police. We'll tell them it was Pop's money, too. Yeah, I'll never believe you. I'm the only one who knows about the debt. Remember that. <laughs> That's where you're wrong, Mr. Murphy. You aren't the only one. Huh? Who was that? Oh, boy, the shadow... He's here just like he said he'd be. Now, where are you? I can't see anyone. I shall remain quite invisible to your eyes, Mr. Murphy. But you're going to hear me, and you're going to do as I say. I, I don't understand this. I know all about this episode of the stolen money, and I realize that Mr. McNulty was wrong in what he did. But his reason for doing it is one that I shall always admire. What do you mean? Mr. McNulty has a family, a fine family, a wife and son. He loves them both very dearly. Things have not gone too well for that family for a long, long time. You wouldn't know what that means, Mr. Murphy. You can't realize how a man feels when he wants to give everything to his loved ones and he has nothing to give. No, that doesn't justify... Wait, let me finish. Wait. He never bothered you for that money you owed him, although many times he needed it very much. Then Christmas time approached. He asked you for the money, and you refused. That $65 meant the difference between happiness and despair to his wife and son. And what he did to you, he did for them. I see. Do you know what Christmas really means, Mr. Murphy? It's a time of forgiveness, of man's goodwill to man. You must know that feeling. You must show it by letting bygones be bygones between you and the McNulty's. I... I see what you mean. I want whatever has stood between you 
to be forgotten. Tonight, that young boy is singing in the choir at the cathedral. I want you to join him and his family. Go with them to the church. Open your heart and your hand in forgiveness to them and all mankind. Lovely Lamont. Church, the choir, everything. Yes, it was beautiful. Oh, look, Lamont. It's snowing again. Soft, gentle snow, covering the city with a blanket of white. See, that's almost like po- poetry, ain't it, Pop? Yes, Joey. Poetry. Shall we walk home, Mr. Murphy? Uh, yes, I'd like to very much. Come on, Mother. Of course, Tim. Golly, ain't that swell away Pop and Mom and Mr. Murphy are friends and everything? Well, Joey, that's the spirit of Christmas. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Hey, Mr. Clancy, that's all right. I gotta make a note of that in my notebook. just a moment, we'll hear once again from the shadow. But now, a Christmas message from John Barclay, America's home heating expert. Mr. Barclay. Thank you. And good evening, friends. Well, once again, Christmas Day is almost here. As I recall it, our last year's broadcast fell on Christmas Eve. And I'd like to repeat now what I told you then. I wish I could meet each one of you and personally extend to you the season's greetings. But not having that privilege, I I do wish all of you, my unseen friends, a very Merry Christmas. And I especially include in that greeting all the John Barclay servicemen who carry the Christmas spirit of goodwill throughout the year by helping thousands of blue coal customers enjoy greater heating comfort. Now, there may be some of you householders who haven't yet completed your Christmas shopping. And to you, I offer this suggestion for a lasting gift that will be appreciated not only on Christmas Day, but throughout the years to come, I recommend the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator. Merry Christmas, friends, and thank you. The program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters' names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. Next week, same time, same station, the Blue Coal Dealers of America bring you an adventure of the shadow chock full of thrills and dynamic dramatic action. So be sure to listen. And be sure to phone your friendly Blue Coal Dealer for greater heating comfort at less cost. We wish you a very Merry Christmas on behalf of our entire cast.